let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm going to get the sign-in sheet passed around. First off, homework number one, due today, right here. So if you haven't already turned that in, go ahead and set that uh, up at, uh, with the pile there on the corner. Um, a couple of announcements. So, uh, oh, my notebook's going to load on top of this, so uh, we'll see what happens. It may or may not. Um, homework number two uh, is has already been assigned. It's on Blackboard. It's due not Thursday, but the following Thursday. After today, you should be able to handle most of the assignment. The only thing that might be a little unclear on the assignment after today is thermal uh, analysis and thermal loads. But we, if we don't cover that or at least start talking about it today, we will definitely cover that on Thursday. So you'll have a good week to, uh, to handle this assignment. Now remember, I'm going to do the same thing for this assignment that I do for all others. So next Tuesday uh, is the day before it's the lecture before it's due. So uh, if you have any questions or whatnot, I'm going to open the first part of lecture uh, next Tuesday for any questions you all have about the homework assignment. So it's a good idea to have uh, uh, to have given the assignment a, a, a once over. Um, another thing, I've gone ahead and updated the attendance grades on Blackboard, and my, my plan is to probably update attendance once a week, so my, my plan is to do that on Fridays, so uh, when you come in, you know, to class this week, like all, all the attendance grades are posted. I also went ahead and added the point distribution for all the future assignments on Blackboard, so when you, so if you all want to play the at-home game uh, with your, with your grade and whatnot. Uh, the homework's weighted, so like for instance, if I have one homework assignment that's worth, that has 40 points, and one homework assignment that's 50 points, the homework that has 50 points is worth more, so, and, and it's weighted accordingly. So the way I'm going to compute your homework average is I'm going to add up all the possible homework points and everything you earned, and then divide, and that's your, your homework grade. There is an opportunity at the end for some bonus credit uh, on the homework, and so one question I get is, can I get a like over 100% on the homework average, and the answer is yes, you can. So, uh, so yeah, I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, today uh, I want to continue our discussion of axially loaded numbers. Now, last time might have been a little math heavy, and that, it sort of it is what it is. It's sort of the nature of the, of the beast with that first lecture. But this one, I think you're going to see a little bit more reality into the situation. It's a little more grounded, um, and, and there's, uh, I think the analysis, it's a little more interesting today because we're going to start to talk about indeterminate uh, analysis. We might touch on thermal loading. It just depends on, on how we do uh, with time. Okay. So, all right. Uh, let's load this up. Okay. All right. So this is sort of where we left off last time. We sort of introduced this concept. And, and you know, with the three-day weekend, and it's been a while since we've talked, I figured it's worth it to take a few minutes to just Get everybody back up to speed. So, you know, we're talking about axial loads, and it would help if I turn the remote on. I think I do that like every morning. Um, so it started off, you know, our, our discussion started off pretty basic, and we said, okay, well, we know what stress is, and we know what strain uh, is. You know, these were our two fundamental definitions for the semester. And then we know what uh, the relationship between stress and strain uh, in linear regions is. So if we say, all right, here is stress, and we say that here is strain, you know, stress equals E times strain, and uh, solve for the deflection, we get a pretty basic understanding between uh, how much a bar deforms and how much load you apply on it. And it's a function of four things. We have the load that's being applied, however long the bar is. We have the modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus, and then we have the cross-sectional area. Now, um, we got to break out the C word, got to break out a little bit of calculus if we have a situation where the load varies or the uh, area varies. So uh, those are your your more realistic scenarios where you're going to have to break out the calculus. Now, if you have a constant area and a constant load, then you don't have to worry about calculus at all. Um, but if you do, you got to break that out a bit. Now, we, um, we did a couple of examples. Example five was a, a situation where the load varied, uh, and it was a pretty uh, 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 
realistic example of load varying, which is basically looking at the self weight of the bar. As the bar gets longer, it gets heavier, so that's where the load varies. And then we did this one where the area varies. Now, those, those uh, examples are to get you really more familiar with this, but I, I want to break out a, an additional, I want to say complication, but I really do think it makes the analysis a little more interesting. And I want to break out the issue of indeterminacy. So I, I want to consider the following truss. Uh, it's a two-bar truss, and I'm just using this to, to, to make an example. If I do a method of joints analysis around that upper joint, I have two members framing into that joint. So I've got two forces inside those members that I don't know. So let's say for our discussion that P is like, I don't know, 500 pounds. Okay, so if I'm putting 500 pounds on that upper joint sort of going down, there are two unknown forces, whatever the force in this member is, whatever the force in this member is. But I can solve for those directly because if I have two unknown forces, I can solve for them with two known equations. And those are my equations of equilibrium, my equations of statics. In other words, I know that sum of forces in the x direction has to be equal to zero. And I know that sum of forces in the y direction has to be equal to zero. So if I have two equations and two unknowns, we, we term that a system that's statically determinant. In other words, um, I have everything I need in equilibrium to be able to solve for, uh, for that uh, uh, for that for those forces but if I do this well that's that's an added wrinkle okay because now I need more okay? if I do a method of joints analysis around that joint I'm not going to have two unknown forces I'm going to have three okay so I cannot use statics alone to solve for that it doesn't work okay so in other words I have to break out another relationship and that other relationship is what we call compatibility and compatibility is basically just a fancy way of saying that whenever you apply a load to a structure, it deforms. And all compatibi compatibility relationship state is that those deformations have to be consistent uh, with one another. They have to coincide. And, and that'll be, and if that's a little bit of a fuzzy uh, uh, concept, it'll become real clear after we do these couple of examples, okay? So this is a, so what we're, we're um, getting into right now is a real reason, if you will, why we're in this class. Because if I look at this example, you cannot do this example with statics. You can't do it. There's too many unknowns. You can only do this example with some understanding of the mechanics of this structure's deformation. Hence, why we're even in this class. And this is a very common and realistic example of what you might see uh, in the real world. Now. We have uh, two types of indeterminacy that we are going to deal with uh, as engineers. Uh, we term those internal indeterminacy and external indeterminacy. We're going to deal with internal indeterminacy force, uh, or internal indeterminacy first, not force, first. Uh, and then we'll deal with external uh, later. Um, but the way that we're going to solve these, uh, these problems is to look at their displacements and their deflections and make sure that they coincide. So I have here a, a member, it's one and a half foot long, and this is a composite member, okay? So what I mean by composite member, I mean this is made of two materials, okay? Now what I have here is I have a brass core, and I have sort of an aluminum sheet, an aluminum surrounding. So if you look at that second uh, bullet, uh, or, so, or those first, those, those two sort of inner bullets, we have a column that is in total four inches in diameter. But the inner core of that, uh, that uh, member is made of brass. So we have a two-inch brass core, and we have a surrounding of aluminum that makes it four inches in diameter. So when I cut a samurai sword or lightsaber through this cylinder and I look at it, I'm going to have two materials. So I'm going to have two materials, I'm going to have two cross-sectional areas. So that's going to be something that we need to compute right offhand. Now the member is one and a half foot long, and it's subjected to a load of 9,000 pounds. What I want to know is what's the stress in each material. And I've been given the Young's moduli for each of the materials, the Young's modulus for aluminum and the Young's modulus for brass. Okay? So I'm going to use these and these compatibility relationships uh, to solve for this problem. Now, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're still copying this down to where, I'm going to copy a lot of these, uh, these parameters down on the, uh, uh, on the notebook here in a second. So do you need me to leave it up here for a second? 
So I, I think you'll think this problem, this is where it starts to get a little neat. Right. Okay. So, example seven. Okay. I'll wake you all up. I'm messing with you. All right, don't write that down. Don't do that. All right, let, let's write down some given information about the column. Okay, tell me something that we know about this column. Here, I'll go back to the slide. Let's just start writing down everything that we know. So I'm going to put this sort of right here. What do we know about the column? Somebody spit something out. It's one and a half feet long. Okay. Now, the, the length is one and a half feet. But if you look at all the other information, everything else is in inches, right? So I'm going to go ahead and convert that right now. So I'm going to say um, L is 1.5 feet or 18 inches. And get that out of the way. All right. We also know the E values, the Young's modulus value for, uh, for each of the materials. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. And I'm going to say that E for the brass is, I think that's 15 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then E for the aluminum, I'm just going to write that, is 10 times 10 to the 6 PSI. So again, Young's moduli are big values. It's like 10 million PSI, 30 million PSI. That's okay. Did I get that right? Yeah, I got that right. I, for a second, I thought it was backwards. Okay. All right. Do we know anything else about this, uh, this column in terms of its construction, its geometry? We know the diameters, right? So if, if I samurai sword or lightsaber, if you're a sci-fi fan, through the, the column, I have, so I'll say the cross section here. Okay, this is the best circle you're going to get out of me. So we've got that. We've got that. That's about the best you're going to get. I'm not that good at that. Here, I'm going to, that's good enough. Okay, all right. So we know that the outer diameter is, what, four inches? So this dimension here will say the outer diameter is four inches. And we know that the inner diameter here is two inches, right? Okay, and what we know is that the inside of the column is brass. Okay, so this is brass. And then it is surrounded by aluminum. Okay, so this is aluminum. Okay, so let me ask you this. How do, if I cut a section, I'm looking at that, how do I determine the area of the brass? How, what's the area of the brass? Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 hold on, go ahead. Pi R squared. Pi R squared for that, right? Or pi D squared over 4. So uh, either one works. So we'll say that the area of the brass is pi over 4, and then the diameter is that inner diameter, right? It's that 2 inches, so that's pi over 4 times 2 inches squared, so that's just pi, right? So it's like 3.142 inches squared, right? Okay, now that's the area of the brass, okay? All right, so if I wanted to paint that brass red, I would need to paint an area that's 3.142 square inches, okay? Now, how do I determine the area of the aluminum? Go ahead. There you go. The area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle, because all I care about is the area of the pipe. 
So what you can say is this. You can say, you can do that two ways. You can say the area of the aluminum is pi over 4 d outer squared minus pi over 4 d inner squared or factor it and just say pi over 4 d outer squared minus d inner squared. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. So pi over 4, then we have 4 inches squared minus 2 inches squared. So what does that come out to be? It's like, it's Tuesday, we had a three-day weekend, it's 8 in the morning, are you really making us break out our calculators? Come on, man. Come on, Dr. Mike. Seriously. It's too early. Nine point four two. And I'll, I'll just add another. I got five, right? Like about like that. Now, do I have a second on that? All right. Okay. All right. Now, okay. Um, what other data point do we know about this section? We're missing one. There's there's one value we're missing. P. We know that we're putting 9,000 pounds on this column, right? Okay, so we know that P is 9,000 pounds. All right, so that, that's the one thing we're missing. Now, so P is 9,000 pounds. So far so good? Okay, all right. Let's start to attack this structure from a static standpoint and let's see what happens. Now, let's just make sure we're understanding the physics of the situation. I got this column and I'm taking this column and I'm pushing it. Okay, so I'm taking this column and I'm pushing on it like this. The column is pushing back, right? But there's two, I'm not really pushing on one column, I'm pushing on two. I'm pushing on this brass core and this aluminum pipe, okay? Here's what I propose is going to happen, okay, from an equilibrium standpoint. So we'll say equilibrium, and we'll say cut a section, okay. So here's my sort of, I got like a load plate from here up top, and I'm putting this force here, this P is 9,000 pounds, like that. Now, what I've got is I've got sort of a column that looks like this. Here's my column. Oh. I got the column, but then I got that core. So I'm going to sort of do that. Does everybody see what's going on there? So it's a core inside. All right. Now, if that's the situation in real life and I have a column hanging out in space and I got 9,000 pounds pushing down on it, it's going to fall down, it's going to hit my foot, right? The reason why is because the column is pushing back up. Now I propose that there's two forces being pushed back up. I've got this force in the middle, which we'll call P brass, and we've got the force on the outside. Now I'm going to kind of draw it like this. I'm going to say about like that because, you know, where it's a pipe, it's sort of all around. And we'll say P aluminum. And so I propose that if I sum forces in the y direction, what I'm getting is this. I'm getting that P aluminum plus P brass has got to equal 9,000 pounds. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Let me box that. Let me call that equation one. Okay. Now, he, here's the problem with that equation. All it tells us is that when you add up the force in the aluminum and the force in the brass, that they're going to add up to be 9,000 pounds. But honestly, that's all it tells you. Okay. For all I know, this is 5,000 and that's 4,000. This could be six and three. It could be 45 and 45. It could be anything. Without any other information, that's it. I, I, in statics land, this is where the problem would stop because we wouldn't know anything else. But in here, we can handle this problem 
a little differently. And we can actually solve for a real answer. Here's how. Okay? We have two unknowns and we only have one equation. We need another equation. Let's look at the situation again. I've got this column. I'm putting 9,000 pounds on this column. What do you think is going to happen to the column? If I take the column and put 9,000 pounds on it, what's it going to do? It's going to squish, right? It's going to get shorter. Okay. Now, I'm taking that load and I'm putting it on both the aluminum and the brass. Okay. Now, imagine here's my hand and I'm putting 9,000 pounds on it. I start here and I end there, right? So I've taken the column and I've gotten shorter. What can you tell me about the aluminum and the brass? They deformed the same amount. In other words, if let's make up a number. Let's say it's two inches. If I pushed the aluminum down two inches, I pushed the brass down two inches as well. Make sense? So this is my first equation. My second equation is this. Okay. I propose that my second equation comes from compatibility. And I propose that delta aluminum has got to equal delta brass. That is my second equation. And that is how we're going to solve this problem. Now, I'm running out of a little bit of room on the sheet here, so I'm going to go on to the next panel. But everybody okay with this? All right. Let me show you how we're going to do this. It's pretty neat. Has everybody got this? All right. All right. So we have delta aluminum equals delta brass. Now, let me ask you a question. Do we need to break out any calculus for this? I would say no, okay? The only reason that you ever need to break out the calculus is if the load varies or the area varies. Well, I can tell you that the area doesn't vary because whether if here's my column, whether I samurai sword here or here or here or here, it's still that two-inch core and that four-inch outer diameter. That doesn't change. It's the same area across the, the column. That's point one. The load. The only thing I'm doing this column is putting 9,000 pounds at the top. So whether I cut it here or here or here or here or here or wherever, it's still 9,000 pounds going up. So if the load is constant and the area is constant, no need to break out the calculus. So what, let's just go back to basics. If I have a bar with an axial load, how do I calculate the deflection? Deflection equals what? First formula I showed you today. PL over EA, right? Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. So before you write anything down, just wa watch with me, okay? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say P for the aluminum, L for the aluminum, over E for the aluminum, and A for the aluminum equals P for the brass, L for the brass, E for the brass, and A for the brass. So this is an equation, right? All right. Help me out about something. What's going on with the lengths? Because they're the same. There you go. Exactly right. They're going to cancel each other out because they're the same. So what I'm going to do is this. Instead of writing L for the aluminum and L for the brass, I'm just going to write L because they're both the same. And if I divide both sides by L, they cancel out. So I'm going to do that. See what I mean? So far so good? Now watch this. Okay. Over here on the side, here I'm going to move this over. Over here on the side, what did we get for that other equation? We got the P aluminum plus P brass equals 9,000 pounds, right? So watch what I'm going to do. Would you agree over here on the right, if I just subtract P aluminum, I'm going to get this? 
Oh, fuck. Would you agree with that? If I just subtract that P aluminum over here, that that's what I'm going to get? Simple, right? So watch this. I'm going to take that and I'm going to replace it. So P, alum, P aluminum over E aluminum and A for the aluminum equals, instead of P brass, 9,000 minus P alum over E brass. Whoop, I can do better than that. That's a subscript. A brass. Now look at this. Do we know the E values for each material? Yeah, those are properties for the material that we can look at. Do we know the A values for each material? Yeah, that's where we samurai sorted our lightsaber and just looked. The only thing that we don't know in that equation is the force in the aluminum. So now we've reduced it to where we can solve for this. So at, at this point, it's just a little bit of alphabet soup. So if I have a fraction, remember cross multiply, right? That times that equals that times that. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to cross multiply. And I'm going to say P alum. And then see where I have E brass and A brass? I'm going to sort of shorthand that a bit and say E A brass equals, and then over here, 9,000 pounds. And then E A. Oh, sorry. Nope. I'm getting ahead of myself. Minus P alum. And then EA aluminum. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Excuse me. I'm going to multiply this out over here on the on the right. So P alum EA brass. Here, I'm going I'm to put that in, in parentheses so it's a little easier to see. Looks like brass. You do the same thing over here. I think that's a little easier to see. Okay. Equals, so over here on the right, we've got 9,000 pounds times EA aluminum minus P aluminum EA aluminum, right? Then get all your unknowns onto one side, so I'm going to add that P aluminum over here on the right. So P aluminum EA brass minus P aluminum EA Aluminum equals, oh, plus, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, uh, plus, uh, or, and that equals 9,000 pounds EA aluminum, and then, so what do we do, factor and divide? So apologies if I'm getting a little wordy with my algebra, but I want to make sure I'm documenting every step so everybody can go along with me. So P aluminum equals, so we have EA brass plus EA aluminum equals 9,000 pounds EA aluminum. Okay. So far so good? All right. So let's chug this out because we have everything we need for this. Okay. What is EA of the brass? So we've got 
E of the brass and A of the brass. What was E of the brass? Help me out. I'm going to make y'all tell me what these numbers are. I won't have to go back and forth. But what's E of the brass? There we go. Okay, and then the area of the brass, which one was that? There you go, one, four, two, and then plus. Now, this one was the 10 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then the area of the aluminum, remind me, what was that? It was like 9.425 9 inches squared. And then on the top, we have 9,000 pounds. And then we have E for the aluminum and A for the aluminum. So 10 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then 9.425 square inches. Now, I'm going to let you all do the math on this one. Tell me what we get. Six thousand. Do I have a second on that? All right. Six thousand. So therefore, if the force in the aluminum is six thousand pounds, what's the force in the brass? Help me out. It's three thousand, right? Because we knew that they added up to be three thousand pounds. Pretty slick, isn't it? Okay. Now. Um, this is not something that I'm going to require you all to do, but it's something I want you to kind of have a, a little bit of an understanding of, just, just to look into the, the behavior and the meaning behind these values. Um, in the end, stiffness is a lot like a magnet, okay? And so the reason why ultimately you're getting more force in the aluminum is because of the stiffness, okay? If you calculate EA over L, and I, I, this is just off to the side. In fact, you all have calculators. Let's just play around with this. What is EA over L for the aluminum and EA over L for the brass. Just help me out. I'm just seeing what you get. Anybody got an answer for the first one? What are so E? So we have ten times uh, ten to the six. We have the nine point four two five, and then the length was eighteen. Right. So let so just give me a number for the first one. Anybody got a number? It doesn't matter. I mean, we'll see. What's that? 2.62 times 10 to the 6. That what you, somebody else get something different? To the 7th. Okay, all right, all right. So we should be getting 10 times 10 to the 6 times 9.425 divided by 18. This is for the brass right here. Yeah. 
you're getting five point, say it again. Okay, that's what we're getting for the top one, and this is what we're getting for the second one, right? We're going to wait, we're going to make sure this is all right. So I got seconds on both of these. We're good? All right. This is, this is a nifty little trick. Divide those two and what do you get? Like, what's that divided by that? Two, right? Now, what's this divided by this? <laughs> Marker drop. Um, I'm not dropping the mic. It's expensive. Um, <laughs> the reason, uh, let me let me sort of explain what's going on. Okay. This this fraction here, this EA over L, is a particular term when it comes to axial members, and it's called stiffness. Okay. Basically, EA over L is the relationship between force and deflection. Like, if deflection, like, and I'll, I'll just sort of do this over here. So, if, uh, if deflection is PL over EA, would you agree that P is EA over L times deflection? Like, just flip and multiply? Would you agree with that? So... You know, L goes up here, the EA goes down there. Everybody okay with that? Okay. That EA over L term has a very specific name in mechanics. We call that stiffness, okay? Now, this is stiffness related to uh, axial members. There's stiffness related to torsion, stiffness related to beams. So if you want, if you want a name for this, we call that stiffness. And we call, and we usually call that like K. So like K sub A or K sub P or K, whatever. Um, what you find in indeterminate analysis, like if you have, um, a, a, like we have a composite column here, and that composite column has like two materials. Let's say that you had a composite column that had like 15 materials. I'm not going to make you do anything that that crazy, but let's say it had 15 materials. A way that you can determine the forces in the members is to look at the stiffness. Stiffness is a lot like a magnet, okay? See how the aluminum had the bigger stiffness? The aluminum has more force, okay? So that's just a gut feeling to tell you whether or not what your math is right. By the way, the units for this, you can follow this out, are kips per inch. Or no, no, uh, pounds per inch. This is pounds per inch because everything was in pounds. That's pounds per inch. So, uh, so that's just a sort of gut feeling when you're doing a problem. If you've got, if you're looking at stiffness and you see that one stiffness is larger than the other, you should get larger force in that member. Okay. Now, that's not what this problem was asking for. What was the problem asking for? Let's go, let's go back to, to what it asked for. What did it ask for? It asked for the normal stress in each member. The 6,000 pounds and the 3,000 pounds, those are forces. So how do we get stresses? We take this and we divide it by the area, right? So therefore, and I'll sort of put this uh, down here. So, so sigma for the aluminum is P aluminum over the area for the aluminum and sigma for the brass is P for the brass over the area for the brass. Okay, now let's do the aluminum first. Let's see if we all get the same answer. So what is the stress in the aluminum? So it's 6,000 pounds divided by what's the area of the aluminum? That's the 9.425, right? So what are we getting here? Six hundred and thirty seven. Do I have a second on that? And so that's a stress. And so you said the units are what? Pounds per square inch, six thirty seven PSI. And then the bottom one. So what are we getting for the bottom one? Less than 
955 PSI. Do I have a second on that? All right. So it's sort of an interesting result if you look at the end of it. So this is the answer. Even though the aluminum carried more force, it carries less stress. But also look at the material characteristics. What was the E value for the aluminum? The E value was 10 million PSI, but for the brass it was 15 million PSI. So essentially what's going on is your stronger material is carrying more stress, which from a design standpoint is kind of what you want, right? Make sense? Everybody okay with this? this is, th these, are, these are good observations. I want to make sure everybody's okay with this. Sound good? All right. Okay. All right. If you like that one, then I got another one for you. Now this one is, should be kind of familiar. Like we have one kind of like this. Um, this one, I would argue, is an example a little more of external indeterminacy. I mean, it's, it's sort of a little bit of both. Um, but the, the, our compatibility relationship is going to be a lot different uh, with this one. For instance, if you go back to this example here, if you go back to this example, our compatibility relationship was really easy because we knew that the deflection in the aluminum equaled the deflection in the brass. Right? That was simple. Okay? That's not going to be the case here because if I have a rigid beam and I apply load, this is going to stretch some and this is going to stretch some and they're not going to be the same. Okay? So our compatibility relationship and our equilibrium is going to be a little different in how we, uh, we handle that. Okay? Now, I've got um, dimensions for each of these members, and instead of making you all compute this, I went ahead and gave you areas, gave you Young's moduli, uh, and what have you. But again, if you recall, we kind of seen a problem like this before. This should be very, very familiar. Um, let me go back a little bit. Let's see. So, time warp. Time warp. Remember this? We did a problem very similar to this a while back. It isn't the exact same problem, but this should be somewhat familiar. Let's do the time That's a reference. All right. Okay. So we have uh, two bars. Each of these bars are made of different materials. So I've, been, I've given you uh, an E value. I've given you an A value. And then I also went ahead and gave you a, uh, a, a Young's or a, a yield stress. That's we're gonna we're gonna look at that yield stress uh, a little carefully near the end. I will go ahead and tell you we're not going to use the yield stress at all during the problem, but we are going to use it to make some observations and maybe compute some factors of safety at the end just to see where we're at. Okay. But I'll go ahead and tell you the yield stress we won't use directly at all for the problem. Okay, now I've got uh, a negligible mass on the beam. I got 12,000 pounds here. Let's see, uh, let's see what we get. Okay, so all right, we have example eight. All right, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a free body diagram. In other words, you know, I'm going to treat this a lot like I did the last example. In other words, the first thing that I looked at from, from an equation standpoint was equilibrium. If you recall, the way that we did the last example was we started off, we computed some properties like some areas and some lengths and stuff like that. And then we had to start defining equations. 
and uh, we started off with equilibrium. Now for the column, we just cut a section and looked at it. For this, we're going to have to break out some statics and, and, uh, and be a little more rigorous with it. Okay? So, so here's how I'm going to go about this. Okay? I got this beam that looks something like this. Okay? And it's got a hinge here. And I've got a rod connecting it right here and a rod connecting it right here. Some, something like that, right? And I've got a force being put right here that's 12,000 pounds, okay? Now in terms of distances, this is three feet, this is five feet, this is four feet. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay? <coughs> now, I, if our memory serves, the, uh, yeah, the left one was the steel, the right one is the bronze. Now, here's the thing. From an equilibrium perspective, I have absolutely no clue what the force in this is and what the force in that is. I have no clue. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's call this P steel, P bronze. Okay? P steel and P bronze. Now, from an equilibrium standpoint, though, I do know that this right here, that this point right there is a hinge. And what do I know about hinges from, from a static standpoint? I know my structural analysis folks know this. What's going on at hinges? What, you got two reactions, but you said two. Why don't we have three? Which one are we missing? We know there's a force in the x direction, a force in the y direction. What's missing? The moment. We know that at hinges, what's the deal? We know that the sum of moments at a hinge is zero. So I'm going to sum moments at the hinge. Okay? And you all know how I like to sum moments. I draw myself a little table. All my moments going this way and all my moments going that way. Now, there are reactions here. There is a, a vertical reaction and a horizontal reaction and what have you here, but quite frankly, I don't care about them because if you have a reaction, let's, let's, let's say here, okay, so there is going to be, you know, probably some, you know, vertical reaction here, we'll call it Fy, and some horizontal reaction here, we'll call it Fx. Now, Fx is pretty simple. We know that's zero. Fy. We don't know what Fy is, but ultimately we really don't care. Because if I'm summing moments at the hinge, what's the moment arm? Fy times what? Zero. So it, we don't really care what it is. It doesn't really matter. Okay? All we care about is what's going on over here. So I take each force one at a time. Does that P steel, does that cause moment at the hinge? Yeah, right? Now do I put that on the left side of the table or the right side of the table? If I'm at the hinge, right side. And what's the moment arm from the hinge? Three feet. There we go. So P steel times three feet. Okay. What about the bronze? Does that cause moment? All right. And uh, left side or right side? And from the hinge? Eight foot. So P bronze times eight foot. Okay, and what about that 12,000 pounds? Does that go on the left or the right? Left. And from the hinge? 12 foot. So I got 12,000 pounds twelve foot. All right. So first off, from a units perspective, because I don't I don't like dealing with more units than I need. Did everybody see how I'm gonna have feet on the left and feet on the right. Why don't I just cancel the feet? I don't have to write the word feet over and over again. So over here on the right, I'm just going to write that as 3P steel plus 8P bronze. Okay? All right. And over here on the left, I got 
12,000 times 12, so 12 times 12 is 144. Was that 144,000 pounds? Did I do that right? Okay, all right. This is my equation one, okay? But again, much like the previous problem, that doesn't tell me anything, okay? Like, if all I have is this equation, that's not enough. Like, I can guess a value of P steel and then determine, well, if this is P steel, what's P bronze and vice versa, but it doesn't glean any additional insight into the problem. It doesn't tell me anything. However, the compatibility does, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I want to look at the deflected shape of this structure. And by that, I mean, I want to look at its compatibility. So you'll start to see a little bit of a trend with a lot of these, uh, these types of indeterminacy problems, is that some way, shape, or form, you're looking at its equilibrium and looking at its compatibility. Now, when we look at external indeterminacy, like pure external indeterminacy, we're going to handle that a little indirectly, but you'll see how in the end we're, we're accounting for, uh, for both. Uh, so, just, uh, so just bear with me on this. Now, let me go back to the problem because I want to I make sure that this makes sense. Now, for each of these elements, the steel rod and the bronze rod, I have been given every single piece of information necessary to define what those rods are. And well, let me blow it up so that everybody sees what I'm talking about. Like, let's take the steel rod. How long is the steel rod? It's 36 inches or three foot, right? I know the E for the steel rod. I know the area for the steel rod. I know the E for the bronze. I know the A for the bronze. I know how long the bronze is. So I have all of the characteristic properties necessary to define that rod. Which, by the way, that's another hallmark of indeterminate analysis. In order to properly perform indeterminate analysis, you got to know this stuff, you know? Or there's like that one parameter that you don't know, and that's what you're solving for. So it's something I also want to make sure that you're aware of when you're doing a homework problem or an exam problem. You have to know this stuff, or you have to be able to compute this stuff, or you can't do the problem. Okay, so that's just something to be aware of. Like, if they didn't give you an area, either they want you to solve for it or they gave you the dimensions necessary to compute the area. So it's just something to be aware of, okay? Now, so we know how these two rods behave. Now, what about the beam? Let's talk about the beam. What characteristic do we know about the beam? It's rigid, okay? What I mean by that, when I say rigid, okay, like, Normally, beams, they deform, they bend, okay? Now, for this problem, you know, nothing's ever purely rigid, but for the purposes of this problem, what we're saying is, is that that beam's stiffness is so huge that its deformation is going to be negligible, so we're going to assume it to be rigid. In other words, when I put that 12,000 pounds on it, it doesn't bend, it doesn't curve or deform like that. The only thing it does is it moves, okay? This is keeping it upright, so all it's doing is moving down. So I propose that if we look at the deflected shape of this structure, it's going to look like this. So bear with my artwork. I'm going to do my best. So... There's the bar before. Here's the hinge. And I propose that afterwards it looks something about like that. That's about the best you're going to get out of me in terms of artwork. So apologies. Okay. Now, remember, there's a rod hanging right here, and there's a rod hanging right here. So what happens to those two rods? They, they stretch out, right? So 
I propose that this dimension right here, we're going to call that delta steel. And we're going to call this dimension right here, we're going to call that delta bronze, right? Now help me out else, or help me out on some other dimensions. This dimension right here is three feet. This dimension here is five feet, right? So far so good? Okay. So let me sort of translate that into a triangle that I think is a little easier to see. So we have a triangle that looks like that. then we have a dimension about right here. That's a right triangle. This is three foot. This is five foot. All right. This is delta steel. This is delta bronze. I propose that from a compatibility standpoint, delta steel is to 3 as delta bronze is to what? 8. Make sense? So this, that's equation 2. Is everybody okay with that? If you understand that, I promise you, everything from here on out is algebra. Everything from here on out is algebra, okay? Let's play around with equation two a bit, okay? Let's play around with equation two, all right? And look, let me be, also be clear. There is absolutely no magic to what I'm doing, you know, solving, you know, expanding this equation or rearranging that one. This is all just algebra. As long as you follow the rules of algebra and keep an eye on the prize, like solving for one of those forces, I really don't think you can get this wrong. This is just, you know, it's just expanding. Okay, so let, let's expand equation two a bit. All right. So we have delta steel over three feet. So how do I do that? Would that be P steel? length of steel, E steel, A steel, three foot equals the same thing for the bronze. Nope, that's L. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, can we cancel the lengths like we did last time? No, because in this problem, the lengths are different. See, it isn't like the last problem where the aluminum and the brass had the same length. Here, this is three foot and that's eight foot, so we can't cancel them. They're, they're different different elements, all right? But what we can do, we can do a little bit of plugging and chugging, can't we? I mean, can't we solve for one of them? Now, I'm just picking one. I'm, I'm just going to make this simple. Let's solve for P steel, okay? Now, I'm going to solve for P steel by flipping and multiplying. Okay, so all this stuff over here is going to be flipped and multiplied. So what I'm going to have is this. I'm going to say P steel equals, so I've got P bronze, length of bronze, 8 E bronze, a bronze t 
times and then three foot E steel A steel over length of steel. Do you all see what I did? So I took, you know, I covered this and I took this fraction and flipped it and multiplied. All right? Everybody okay with that? Now, I'm going to do something that's a little weird on this problem, and you all are, are going to go, the, the folks who go nuts about units are going to go, blasphemy, this is all wrong. And I think you're, you're going to see how that might not be the case. Now, now watch this. This is all one big fraction, right? One big fraction. So let's start plugging and chugging. Now, P bronze, I have no idea what P bronze is, so I'm going to put that off to the side. So P bronze. Now, the length of the bronze. What's the length of the bronze? Anybody know what that is right offhand? Eight foot, right? Now, up until now, we said, no, 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 that's 96 inches, right? I'm going to leave it as eight foot. And you're going to go, oh, you can't do that. Hold on. All right. Eight foot. Okay, what else goes on top? We have uh, three foot. E for the steel. What's E for the steel? Anybody have that on hand? All right, what about area for the steel? What's that? Inches squared, right? Now, what about on the bottom? I've got eight foot. Um, e for the bronze, what's that? 12 times 10 to the sixth PSI. Area for the bronze is 0 0.5 inches squared. And then what about the length of the steel? Oh, goodness. Three foot. So one of the nifty things about a lot of these problems is that because you end up taking like stiffness and divided by stiffness, as long as your units are consistent, that's fine. Like, I le like if you look over here on the symbols, I left the length in feet over here because I left that length in feet. You know, if I had converted that to inches, I could convert that to inches, but in the end it's all going to divide. Like you multiply that by 12 and that by 12, it all cancels. So as long as your units are consistent, they're fine. Like look at your fraction. What do we got? A feet, a feet, a PSI, a square inches on the bottom. A feet, a feet, a PSI, and a square inches. It all cancels. So it's just going to be a number. Okay. So that's where writing those units out really matter. So what do we get here? It's going to be an interesting number. Well, it'll be a simple number. Let's just put it like that. You got five. Do we have a second on that? Anybody else get five? You should have because that's right. <laughs> so five. And so that's P, remember, that's P bronze times five. Okay? So, in other words, let me sort of rewrite this. All this stuff down here, is saying that P steel is 5 P bronze. So what I'll say is that is also equation 2, but I'll say revisited. In other words, what we did is we took equation 2, expanded it, redid it a bit, and we got that. Not too bad, right? This isn't that bad. So now what I want you to do is I want you to look at equation number one and look at this version of equation number two. Now the problem doesn't seem so complicated, does it, right? Because now all we have to do is replace P steel with 5P bronze, solve, and we're golden. So let's see what we get. Um, does everybody have all this? Uh, go ahead. All right. All right. So, 
So say plug two into one. So we have three P steel, but that's five P bronze plus eight P bronze is 144,000 pounds. So three times five is 15 plus eight is 23. So 23 P bronze is 144,000 pounds. So what's P bronze? So 62, 60.9 pounds, right? Do I have a second on that? So if that's P bronze, what's P steel? That's simple, right? That's just five times that. So what is five times P steel? Anybody got a number for me? What's that? 0.5, something like that, about like that. Fine, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see how it is. I'm taking a mistake off the counter now. We're in negative territory now. I'm just messing with you. All right, do I have a second on that? Okay, now, again though, from a mechanic standpoint and from a design standpoint, like that tells us what we need to know to do an evaluation, but really to do the evaluation, we don't need forces, we need stresses. So how do we compute the stress in the bronze and the stress in the steel? Divided by the area. So therefore, the stress in the bronze is the force in the bronze divided by the area of the bronze is what? And then the stress in the steel is the force in the steel divided by the area in the steel. Now the steel, remind me, that was the one that was one square inch, right? So 31,304 divided by one is just 31,304 PSI, right? So what about the other one? 12, 5, 20, and this, that's probably going to round up a little bit, right? Probably like 5, 5, 22. Is everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Is that good? All right. So there's your answers. So far so good? That's not bad, right? It's pretty simple. Now, let me ask you this question, okay? Um, and let me bring up the other screen. I don't know if that's easy to see. Maybe, maybe you can tell me. Have these yielded? No, right? Because the yield stress in the bronze is 20,000 PSI, it's only experiencing 12,000, right? The yield stress in the steel is 35,000, it's only experiencing 31, right? So it has not yielded, okay? What I'm going to do off to the side is I'm going to compute a factor of safety, okay? And so here's how I'm going to do that. So we'll take the bronze first. We're going to compute a factor of safety against yielding. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute that by saying sigma allowable over sigma actual. Okay? So for this scenario, I'm going to say that it's allowable stress is it's yield stress. So what's the yield stress for the bronze? 20,000?
over 12,522. So somebody got a number for that? Say it again. 1.60. Do I have a second on that? All right. Now for the steel. That is, uh, what's the yield stress? 35,000 over 31,304. So what do we got? 1.12. Do I have a second on that? So which rod is living life a little closer on the edge. The steel rod, okay? So this will introduce you to a little bit of lingo about factors of safety, okay? What would happen if we had a factor of safety less than one? What would that mean? That's a bad day, right? Now, it, you know, you're using the term uh, failure, you're using the term yielded. What I'm going to use, I'm going to use a more generic language, and I'm going to say that the actual stress has exceeded what we're going to allow on it. That could be yielding, it could be a number of things, okay? So the closer that value is to one is when we're living life close to the edge. Now, you know, a lot of times in design, once you've accounted for uncertainties and and probabilistic instances and whatnot, you can actually have a, a factor of safety pretty close to one and, and you're, you're fine once you've accounted for all those uncertainties. If you don't know how to account for those uncertainties, then you want your factor of safety to be higher and higher. Now, that being said, if I had a factor of safety of 12, I'd probably think that's a bit too much and I need to redesign, okay? So at some point in your design, usually you need to pick a factor of safety and use that as your guiding principle. So on the flip side, if we were in design mode, if we said our target factor of safety is one and a half, let's just make that up as a number, one and a half. What that tells me is that this is too big, that's too small, okay? So this, the, uh, the bronze rod, can probably have some weight shaved off of it and the steel rod needs to be beefed up some. And that's design, okay? We have a steel rod, we know it's inadequate, so it needs to be larger. The bronze is a little too much, it can be backed off, okay? That's design in a nutshell. Whether you're a mechanical engineer or civil engineer or what have you, that's what we're after, okay? Does that make sense? So that's sort of like what I said, when I said at the beginning that this is a very linchpin type class, that this is a really, you know, really important stuff. That's what I meant, is that this stuff is used uh, quite a bit. Um, we don't have very much time, so I'm probably going to call it here in a second. The only thing I, I want to sort of, you know, set the stage for later is thermal effects, which is what we're going to talk about uh, on Thursday. But the idea is it goes back to basic chemistry. When objects heat up, they expand. When they cool, when they, uh, cool down, they contract, okay? So if I take um, an element, you know, an axial member or whatever, and I apply heat to it or I reduce its temperature, it's going to change volume accordingly. So for our purposes, what we do is we define a constant called alpha, okay? That alpha relates a member's strain, so change in length over the original length, it relates its strain to the change in temperature, okay? So basically what alpha will tell you, alpha will tell you how much strain you can expect per degree change. So if I have a bridge girder and I erect it when it's 70 degrees outside and I go and check it in the winter when it's minus 20, it's undergone a change in temperature of 90 degrees, right, in, in the negative. So I would expect that from the day I constructed it to the day I observe it, it's going to get short, okay? Now what I'll do is I'll say, okay, if that girder is made out of steel, I'll look up the alpha value for steel, multiply that by the change in temperature, and that'll tell me the strain. And if I know that that strain is 0 .00 or whatever, I can multiply that by, say, 80 foot, if the bridge is 80 foot long, that'll tell me how much it's shortened, okay? Now, alpha values, just like E and just like Poisson's ratio and yield stresses and whatnot, are all material-related properties, so they're lookup values. They're something that you'll know. 
there's an E value for bronze, and an E value for, or an alpha value for bronze, alpha value for aluminum, alpha value for steel, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to take what we've been doing so far and throw another uh, 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 monkey wrench into the situation, and we're going to add what happens when you take one of these bars and heat them up or cool them down. And whether you're a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer, that's something that's greatly going to affect you. That's all I got, guys. I will see you all on Thursday. If you haven't already done so, homework. Turn it in at the end. Y'all have a great day.